we now start 1941 winter term. Pick occupation policies and I add three, four, five, six to it. I rolled a six, that's a 12. And I have varied, I succeeded in occupation policies. But the axes are gonna try to go for Yugoslavia. They have three DPs in there. The allies have none. And covert operations, you have to have DPs in the country to do covert. And the British already used theirs anyway. If Russia has not entered any part of Eastern Europe other than Eastern Poland, that's not true. They went into the Baltic States and Romania. If Germany really has attacked Spain, nope. If Germany had an economic interest in the Balkan countries, no. If France has fallen, no. If Germany really declared war, nope. And no to that result for Yugoslavia. If Russia and Romania fought over Bessarabia, yes, plus one. If Russia is at war with any Balkan country other than Germany, no. If Russia unsuccessfully attempted to subvert, yes, two more. That's three. And that's it. So it's a plus three, plus the three that the Germans put in. It's a plus six to the die roll. For Yugoslavia, we put a five and six is an 11. And we needed nine more. So Yugoslavia activates as a German minor ally. The allies may build three partisans there. So we get the troops on the board. I'm going to set up Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia has six one threes, a two three, and a one plane. Geographical limitations to the Balkan countries and Yugoslavia. They're allowed to go into uh, Greece, Bulgaria, Romania, Eastern Europe, and Russia. So that's where we want them. And remember, our big problem here is getting troops into Russia. So now I've got more with Yugoslavia. And next year we're going to concentrate on getting the Ukraines. We may lend some Italian units over there. Once we've given up this front, we'll see. So just more troops over there is always needed. Now the Russians are thinking about Ukraine because they have DPs in there. But it can only be named if the Axis control Kiev. So you do the diplomatic phase first and then you do the turn. So the Germans take Kiev. Now the next turn, they pick it. If they were to pick it, the Germans would get this plus two. It would be the first turn after Kiev is first controlled or isolated by the Axis. So the Axis would get a plus two. The modifiers come out to the Russians have a minus three, the Germans a plus two. So it's actually in favor of the Russians by a minus one. But remember, they have two DP points. And two DP points make it a minus three. So the Russians say, I'm picking... Ukraine and I have a minus three, but the Germans see the Russians don't know that the Germans researched varied occupation policies So the Germans say wait a minute varied occupation policies and They have a nine so in addition to eight so Russia is a plus two modifier for the Ukraine diplomatic role. So you take a plus two modifier on the Ukraine die roll the, the Russians have a minus three that leaves the Russians with a with a minus one roll and they're going to try to stop the Ukrainians from joining the Germans if the Germans try to get them. So here's their roll. They rolled a 2. Minus 1 is a 1. And 1 has no effect. So the Russians miss that. But that's a good move on the Russians' part, trying to take the Ukrainians out. So for the winter turn, the U.S. Axis Tension Table, we have 2 for the turn. There's 1, 2, and then I'm taking an offensive in the east. Take an attrition in the med, and that's it. So remember, by 42, we want to stay under this number. And that's where we're at. And just take the axis turn, because we're going to concentrate a lot on the Pacific side now, that the war between the Japanese and Americans are starting, a lot of carrier stuff rolls. So here, I'm just going to take the turn and then show you what I have in the result. For the Germans, just more of uh, building up the defense in this area. 
moving everything to the Russian front. I'm going to pick some weak breakthrough points here, probably here, here, try up there, and bust through with exploding tanks. Get the Yugoslavians to the front down here, set up my line. The British outnumber us in aircraft here because I pulled some back here. The Italians can't. I could take an offensive right here. To do that, we have to run the oil supply again. Um, I may not do that. I think we're happy just sitting there right now with an offensive. He would... He has five aircraft and so do I, so I'd get no aircraft. Five, I'd be about 11. I mean, I'd be able to attack this guy. Couldn't get him. So what's the point? Let's just start attrition. We'll just do that. Uh, that means I don't have to run oil down here this turn. Unless I want to use defensive air support. So I may still run oil. So we'll go through that and I'll let you know the decision and the outcomes of the battle. Remember, I got five aircraft down here. He only moved four in. Remember, he only moved four in because he didn't have all the ships. He just was able to pull all his ships out of the SW box now because the Americans are taking over there. So the British, even though they have still more dead ships there than the Germans and the Italians, they... Uh, or about equal if you combine the Italians. They're getting more ships back because of the ASW uh, returning from the strategic warfare. So they're going to start getting stronger here. So we need to hold on. Okay. So I'll take the turn for winter and then be back. Oh, also the winter now you have the Russian uh, winter die roll. And let's do that. If you look on the Russian winter table... We get minus one for each successive winner. Well, this is the first one. You get a minus two axis variant 19. Let's see what we got on our research. Because I know we got something for our research results. There we go. French military. Let's allies. Winter preparation. We get a minus one. So we'll see. So the, the winter die roll. Here we go. It's a two. Becomes a one. Axis overruns and exploitation movement are prohibited. So, we didn't get hit that hard. And we just can't overrun and exploit. We'll come back when my Axis turn is done. The Axis are done. We basically attacked the entire Russian front along here. We basically killed every Russian unit on the front line. Okay, That's all the dead. And then the way when you double up and you go to attack, then you take one unit and you advance it into the hex. That way you always leave a unit behind. And we want a double line. Just like the Russians do, well, the Germans are going to start needing a double line. Now the tanks are still way out here. But my next objective is I want Sevastopol, Rostov, and this beach to be protected. And then my flanks protected here. And then I'm heading to Stalingrad. And then I really need to do better here. I need Smolensky and I need to get, I need to be up in this area. So we'll see how it goes. Now, after that, I was able to do nine SRs. I bought everything I had, plus the two fleets that were lost. And I SR'd all my infantry I could to the front to fill the gaps. In addition, I was able to buy two more. Russian separatist units factors because there's more than 20 Russian dead and varied uh, occupation policies gave me that. Down here we killed two units in our attrition and the British elected to take off the replacement they had here and a 1-3 here. They didn't want to take off any more powerful stuff. Uh, they stopped. I tried to run oil here because I wanted to operate these planes so when the British tried to attack, I had planes, but they stopped it. Now there's no air cover down here. 
and the British may be able to advance, but I built a partisan, and remember, I'm allowed two partisans, they had killed one before, I built it and put it right there where they took their unit off, because I wanted to take that hex away from them trying to gain enough power in here to destroy it, because he's got three tanks there, not to mention he still has a 2-5 tank over there. Uh, the Italians, I moved a 1-4 up where the 4-4 was. Now there's a 5-4 there, and I SR'd a German 2-4 that I had lost. I SR'd it down here. So I want to get more planes in this area to win this battle. Now I ran out of SRs. I used all nine, but I want the paratrooper down in this area too. I want to start threatening Malta. So the Axis turn, winter 1941 is done. And we will go to the Allies' turn. They only had 15 BRPs left, and they used them. And they attacked a partisan right here, exploited the German tank. Because it wasn't supplied, it acts like an infantry unit. So it has no armor side of it. The mechanized are stalled. They can't be used. So it wasn't doubled on defense. And I exploited with two tanks and took it. So I own this, this, and I cut off with zone of control these two infantry units and this infantry unit. So I got three Italian infantry units isolated right there. I, in the movement phase, I had moved some ships from Scapa Flow to there, some on Malta. I don't like to keep ships on Malta, Malta because the Axis can bomb it. But I took the one three off because I planned on SR in it, and I did. And I put it right here. I wanted it in Cairo. Then the Western Desert Armored Force that was still in Gibraltar was SR'd to here. So I got all the ports and cities covered, isolated units, and I'm starting my push here in Africa. I wasn't able to build anything. However, the Americans, they're allowed to send the British 10 BRPs. So the British are actually sitting at 10 right now. Germans are at 7. The Italians are at 2. And we will move to the Russians' turn. Basically, buy their troops, set up a line. The Russians. The Russians just made the best line they can. You kind of move some pieces up to the armor units because you can't build next to them. Like this piece was one piece I had in Rostov. I moved them there. Otherwise, you see everything else is away from the armor. These pieces move next to the armor. So you can get them there. And then there was no army here. And we took an attrition. We ended up killing uh, three units and got a hex. And so we picked the armor unit that was here. That So we tried to straighten out our line here a little bit. Now, the Russians only had 15 units, $15 to build. So they built 15 units. And with that, we put, we wanted to cover that Sevastopol, these two beaches, and then we put a line because in the spring turn, the winter snow ice is melting in the spring. And so all the roads are mud, wet, soggy. And so in the spring, there is not allowed any exploitation or overruns. So the Russians don't have to worry about building a double line. They just got to make sure they protect it all the way across. They did. And they even put some extra troops back up. Now, one thing I forgot to mention was in the summertime, I'm allowed to start Siberian transfers. The Siberian transfers on the first turn is one armor unit and three, three, three shock Siberian troops. They get SR'd out of here into the Urals. And then this turn, they got SR on the board. So you're going to see an, another 3 5 tank. That's seven 3 5 tanks. And. Three more 3-3 three, three shock infantry units that have shown up here on the line. There's one. And where did I put the other ones? I think I put one there, there, and there. So they showed up. And so the Russian turn is done. We moved the airplanes. We didn't have enough money to buy everything back and the plane. So they only have 15 BRP. So... The European side is just about done, except for the SW phase. So let's go ahead and do the SW phase. The last round, 
the British have two with two American fleets and the Germans have six subs now let's see I think the Americans can add some more here let me see so the US is allowed to put another nine fleet in there and an ASW factor so let me get those so that's where we're at so the German subs at two four six times three they have a chance of eliminating 18 BRPs let's roll and they rolled an eight any modifiers well there's the one ASW modifier that the Allies put on so that's a seven then there's one two three there's six and we're even up on the modifier there so it's a seven so on a seven it's fifty percent so at 18 nine BRPs are lost and guess what the British had ten they have one BRP remaining so the we're not hurting the British that bad with SW's as much as I would probably liked we're starting to get beat up in Africa so now it's a holding on game from here on out except we still have a good chance in Russia and I'm still going to try to get Iraq against the British but this is where you want to take as many objectives as you can and hold on so let's eliminate three fleets eliminate three subs then these three subs are eliminated eliminate ASW are eliminated and the other three subs are eliminated so that's the end of the ASW so the European side is complete now the winter 1941 Pacific side this is where Japan attacks is going to start forget anything I'm gonna follow our little turn sequence thing here and research die rolls there are none uh, none, none. the American player draws magic counters eight in there and at the time of the drawing the Americans uh, reveal that they have a code breaking result so they could draw four magic counters but then the Japanese reveal that they have a code breaking uh, success so it's back down to three magic draw is those three and they get one magic point next we determine the oil effects and we've already marked that out on the tension table one more turn has elapsed the oil effects haven't taken effect yet and you add BRPs for newly activated minor allies okay we have none of that we increase the US BRP level we have already done declarations of war we are declaring war on the United States which automatically puts us at war with the British and the Dutch and that costs 35 BRPs uh, option selection uh, movement phase the option selection is offensive option on the Pacific front offensive option on the southeast front so that's 30 more BRPs it's 65 BRPs we spent and an attrition option in the Asian front now we get the movement phase first thing we stage air units then we resolve counter air missions then we announce all patrols and movement of naval units. Associated minor ally of Thailand. The moment, the moment war breaks out between the British, they become an ally. So we, now we set these up. We're going to put one on the border there. And we're going to put one on the border down here with Malaysia. Now we're going to stage a 5-3 aircraft to Singora. Stage this 5-3 from Japan to an air base. Okay. On then naval base changes. I've already done my naval base changes, but we move out task force. Task force one sells to Pearl Harbor. Task force two sells to the Java Sea in this vicinity from here 
we're able to attack this, 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 and be close enough for the Australians if they try to come over and intercept our invasion force here. Now, now that that patrols are set, we say our base changes and patrols are set. Now we have to establish supply. Now for these units to move off in seaborne invasions and aircraft to fly off of here or pair drop, we have to run supply into Vietnam. And we'll keep it away from these ships as far as possible. We're going to run it up through Hai Phong. So it'll travel from Tokyo right into Hai Phong there. So supply will be traced there. And we have to make sure supply is traced here. Supply is traced here. And that's it. Now the Allies can put a maximum effort against the Japanese to try to thwart them at any possible turn you can and maybe prevent an invasion. Now, the key here is this. If this 9 British fleet exits Singapore, he's allowed to be attacked in this hex because it's said that as soon as he leaves the port, he's in the water and he can be attacked. That's why the 5-3 Japanese is here, so he can attack that right away. If he moves the entire 9 out, then I can just move the entire 5-3 on him, and it favors the airplane in the battle. If you take this out in pieces, a 2 here, a 3 there, a 3 there, then he, he brings the 5 out on one of those. He may stop one, but all the other ones are going to go by. If he splits his airplane up, one aircraft to hit one of the movements, two aircraft to hit another one, then he's weaker in his attack, and now the battle favors the British. So that's what we like to do. So the first thing we're going to do is try to stop the supply to this area. So I'm going to take two ships out of this, and we're going to sell two British ships, and we're going to try to intercept the supply line to Haiphong. I'll let you know what happens. We have to first roll the interception of it and it is one two three four five six seven eight nine ten it's eleven hexes away to complete that interception he needs to roll a one or a two here we go and he got a three he missed so the two fleets that went up there to intercept that nothing happens to them they they go right back home and they wait So that, in, that interception failed. Now we have a chance to intercept this task force as it moves down. And I'm going to choose not to do that. I'm going to throw all my ships out at the invasion forces. So we're not going to intercept that task force. This task force cannot be intercepted by the American fleet because Allied unpreparedness on the first turn. No U.S. fleets can intercept any Japanese missions. And the aircraft are inverted here. And we roll on the Japanese surprise table to see what happens with the three carrier task force here. We break them down into three different task force and they're going to go somewhere. And the Japanese player does not know where they go. So... As the American player, I am now going to roll for the Japanese task force because we're done with all movement, all interceptions. The task force here is going to strike Pearl Harbor. So what I'm going to do now is I'm rolling for the three American task force. It has to be a carrier in each one and six of the fleet. So there's 18 fleets now taken away from the Pearl Harbor fleet. And these will be determined where they're at and what they're doing by dice roll, which I am going to roll right now. Before I do that, I can announce how many magic I am going to put to this Japanese surprise die roll. Now this could be a controversial issue because a person I played said you can't use any magic on the initial Japanese strike. But if you read 
roll number. If you read rule number 67.52 and 67.3, it says that I'm allowed to use it. And if you look at the Japanese surprise table at 67.4, it says you use the Japanese tension level plus the magic draw. So it's clearly that you're allowed to shift the column. And we can reveal how many magic points we wish to use. Now remember, the Japanese player doesn't know how many you draw, but obviously I'm playing both sides, and so I know, but I'm going to say we're going to show one magic point, and he don't know what these are. They're actually turned over. He don't know if I have any more or not, but we're going to say one magic point. So that gets the shift, the Japanese surprise table. Well, what table are we on? We use where the tension level is. The tension level is at 36, so we're on this column. But we threw one magic point out there, so we shifted it one column. So now we're on this column. And so we're going to roll, and this is going to tell us which where each task force is. So let's roll for task force one. Six. Task force one at a six is on a mission. Okay, and just so I don't forget, I'm going to write right here, Task Force 1 Mission. Okay, let's see where Task Force 2 is. That's a 5. Task Force 2 is in the U.S. box. Task Force 2. U.S. box. Okay. Now, again, we don't sh tell the Japanese where we're at. He has no idea. For all he knows, they can all be out here on patrols, and they can show up when he tries to do a second airstrike and actually intercept him. Let's roll for Task Force 3. And we have a 9. Task Force 3 is on a mission. So we'll write that down. So, when I'm done rolling, the Japanese player now doesn't know where the task force ended up. He knows I put one magic point on the surprise table. And now, he gets to roll to see how badly he surprised Pearl Harbor. And we use the modifier on what column we're at. We're at the 37, 39 column. The modifier is a plus 3. So we go to the surprise table. And here it is. And I get to add 3 to the die roll. And we're going to see what we get. And we just got a... So on a die roll of a 6, you add 3 to that. That's a 9. So if you look at that, what we're really interested in is getting more than a 7. A 7 surprise or greater says all air and naval units that are damaged are eliminated. And that's really what we're looking for. So we got that. He gets no cap. This is the first turn anyways. He gets no cap. He can't fly any air. He gets no radar. And that's what we wanted. All damaged units will be eliminated. So, the Japanese assign their task force now, their naval aircraft, of where they're going to strike. So the card, this is how you would set it up. It's one task force, and I put uh, three, six, seven, I put eight planes striking the naval units, and I put ten striking the air units, because I want the air units gone more importantly. And then there was one fleet with this task force. This so is a mistake that you're going to see changed a little bit. Is the carrier task force attacking Pearl Harbor does not have a nine fleet. It has a one factor fleet. That's all you need to put in there is one fleet factor. And that's all you should put in there. The rest of the fleets are attacking over in the Southeast Asian front. So I have too many fleets on the board. So that nine I'm going to change out. 
And I didn't bother moving all the carriers in this section too to be part of combat group one. But let's go on and strike. So we have three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We have eight strike in the naval units. According to the surprise table, I get a plus one for my air attack that, because he's so surprised. And then plus one for each attacking air factor over 10. Well, I don't. I only have eight. And I have Air Force nationality. Well, I am. My nationality is elite Japanese aircraft, so that's another plus one. So I get plus two to this air attack die roll. Let's see what we get. We have six, seven, eight. And eight attack factors we have are eight. And we just killed, remember, all damaged fleets are now dead. So there's three killed, three sunk, four damaged. But that would be a total of seven. So you can see he has 18, he still has 20 fleets there. Uh, so with this many ships there, that's why... To invade Pearl Harbor is quite difficult because let's say we strike and then we're going to do a second air strike and we kill another five ships. Well, in the first turn, we also would have to take Johnston Island here. Pretty simple. You just invade with the one, two. In the double turn flip flop, you then invade Hilo here and you stage uh, five three army aircraft is here to help you bomb the ships but if he has like 15 ships there still and any carriers that show up and their planes well you have to reduce it below a nine to be able to invade so it's quite an undertaking I don't do it we have four army air factors and remember those break down into uh, 4 times 3 is 12. There's actually 12 naval aircraft there, but none of them can fight. And I'm hitting them with 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. I'm hitting them with 10 aircraft. Remember, I get a plus 2 to this air attack roll. Wow, and I got an 11, 12, 13 on a 10. And that's all the way up to 6 and 7. That's 13 aircraft. So I just eliminated the entire U.S. Air Force. And that's a good thing. So that worked out good. So he has no aircraft there to mess with me. Now, magic, he gets to keep it still. Even though he used it to modify that surprise table, he still can use it on his second turn now. So now for the Japanese, they have an option to make a second airstrike or go home now. And we're going to decide to make a second airstrike. Since I got rid of his aircraft, I'm going to go after the ships again. At this point, the Americans can try to intercept. Now the Japanese don't know where the Americans are and if they can intercept. The Harbor Surprise Table... If, you have, if you're on a mission, you're eligible to intercept. If you're in the U.S., you're not. So one task force can't intercept at all, and the other two are on missions, and they have a chance of intercepting. U.S. carriers that are on a mission, they have to roll one, two, or three, and they're able to intercept the Japanese task force. That's only two carriers. That's six planes, and you have one magic point to help modify your surprise table. So... It's not worth it to me to waste the carriers. I'll just take a hit on the ships. Now, so the Japanese player doesn't know what the Americans are doing, though. He has to allocate his aircraft before the Americans say whether he's intercepting or not. So he goes behind this sheet that the Americans don't see. And now, in case the Americans come out, he knows on average only two carriers are probably going to show up. So he can have six naval air. So he's not worried about losing his carriers if he can block four or five of them. So he's going to take four 
I'll tell you what, we'll take five aircraft and put them on cap just in case the U.S. decides to uh, intercept, but I don't think he will. Everything else goes on naval units. So now, so now on the second airstrike, we roll for the surprise table to see how surprised the Americans are for the second strike and if they're ready. At this point, there is no aircraft to be involved with. There's no interception. So basically, the Japanese are going to strike and they're going to roll for the surprise table. Now, whatever they roll, they only get one dice and... The Americans get radar this turn. Remember, all those special rules only apply to the Japanese first strike. So whatever he rolls is reduced by one. And we'll see if the Americans want to now use their magic point to modify the surprise roll. And they will. So the, mag the Americans say we are going to use our magic to modify their surprise table. So the Japanese are going to minus two now. They're going to minus two off this die roll. And it's a two, it goes down to a zero. So very poor surprise. They got nothing. Now we move to the air defense strike. And now the Japanese will find out if the, any Americans were caught in Pearl. They were not, he's told. And so we do an air defense roll, which for every nine fleet factor, including damaged ones, and you round up. So we're going to have three for that because we got because we got two nines, one, two, and then we're heading on another nine, So and you round up. So there's three. We get if the attack units are in a hex containing an objective, which it is, so that's four factors. If the attack units are in a hex containing a fortification, no, if the attack... Air units are no. If the attacked units are in a hex containing a city or port, you get two for each city or port. So remember, he's at four, five, six, seven, eight. So his defense is now at an eight. He gets two for each city or port. Here we go. It's a. Uh, he rolled an eight. Air defense factors are an 8 on an 8. So two Japanese planes are destroyed and three are aborted. So you go to here, three are aborted and two are destroyed. And now we continue with the strike. One, two, three, four, five, six, Seven, eight. So he gets an eight. He gets a plus one for elite aircraft. And he got a six, seven on his air attack table. So he's at an eight and he rolled a seven. So three more fleets are destroyed. So those two. Even after the two strikes, we still have 17 ships here. So his die rolls weren't that great. And maybe we're a little too cautious putting that much cap. We should have probably went for some more on the naval. But I'm okay with that because I'm not attacking Pearl Harbor. If you're really trying to go after Pearl Harbor, you, want to be, you may want to be more aggressive. But that is the end of that. So the Japanese task force being finished now can return back to Japan or truck and it remains on patrol so it can still be used. This patrol remains in its hex and that is the end of the Pearl Harbor strike.